Did you hear the one about the multi-generational family of 50 rats living in a beautiful home in Fort Myers? Patrick Gibson has because he's the one who evicted them. Patrick is a biologist and owner of Professional Wildlife Removal of Cape Coral. And boy, does he have stories to tell. And we're going to hear a few of them on the Royal Palmcast beginning right now. You're listening to the Royal Palmcast, the show about all things real estate. From the production studios of the Royal Palm Coast Realtor Association in Fort Myers, Florida, here's your host, Jim Sandville. Welcome to the Royal Palmcast. I am indeed your host, Jim Sandville. I'm coming to you from the studios of the Royal Palm Coast Realtor Association in beautiful, sunny Fort Myers, Florida. I'm here today with Jerry Johnson. Hey, Jerry. Hey, Jim. I'm here too. You doing okay? I am. Are you doing okay? I'm doing fantastic. I just want to make sure. I want to make sure you're happy. I'm very happy. Thank you for worrying about that. Most people don't don't care how I'm happy I am, but Jim. I know you are. You're a caring guy, Jerry. I am. Caring guy. Enough about that. But uh, I, I do. I want to let you folks know that this is the show where we talk about real estate. We talk about every aspect of it. If you're a realtor, if you're a home buyer, home seller, home owner, uh, we're going to talk about stuff that will be of interest to you. We believe, and today is no exception. In fact, today we're really going to have a fun show because we've got an interesting guy who is in the studio with us today. His name is Patrick Gibson. Uh, Patrick is the uh, owner of Professional Wildlife Removal in uh, the Cape Coral, Fort Myers area of Southwest Florida. Patrick serves all of Southwest Florida, removing and relocating unwanted critters from homes and businesses throughout the area. Uh, Patrick has served more than 4,000 clients, including homeowners, all major property management companies in the area, and businesses such as Walmart, Home Depot, Southwest Florida International Airport, and many real estate agencies from Naples to Port Charlotte. Welcome to the Royal Palmcast, Patrick. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. I am thrilled to have you. Patrick was in the studio with us before, and uh, perhaps you have listened to that episode and learned a little bit about what he does. He is a very busy guy. He uh, removes, obviously, uh, unwanted critters from uh, from, uh, homes and businesses, and sometimes they're alive, sometimes they're dead. But uh, he, he's the guy who gets the call when there's something going bump in the night in your attic. Now, the last time you were on, Patrick, as I recall, I didn't touch on one thing I, I wanted to check with you about, and that's gators. Do you handle gators? I do not handle live gators. Uh, that's going to be the FWC. Um, if anybody has a gator issue there, um, they do that service for free. Uh, they do have criteria on that, though. It's not if you see any gator, they come take care of it. Um, if you have a gator that is six feet or larger, mm. you know, in your estimation, um, and it seems aggressive, uh, if those cr- two criteria are met, they will send somebody out. It's a free service. Their trappers will take that out of there for you, whether it's in a swimming pool. Well, swimming pool will come get no matter what. But if it's in a, uh, a water body near your home, behind your home, in your community, um, they'll take care of that for you, usually within 24 hours. They don't get into attics too much, huh? No, usually not. <laughs> usually not. So, so you, you said six feet or more? <laughs> six feet or larger, correct. So if you get a five and a half footer, you're, 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 you're on your own, right? Well, if it looks like six feet, <laughs> then it's six feet, right? <laughs> exactly. Well, metric. It's a, it's a conversion from the metric to the, uh, the English system. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. So uh, I, w- one thing I want to get out of you today, and I, I know you've got 100 stories, but I've, I've asked you to put a little thought into uh, some of your best stories about wildlife removal, and you have come prepared to do that today. Uh, what, sh- what would you like to share with us? What interesting has ever happened to you, Patrick? Okay, well, a couple things over the uh, the last decade plus. Um, we'll s- let's start with the alligator theme since we we ended on that. Yeah. Um, so I said I don't do live alligators, which I don't. Um, that's its own dedicated thing where guys just do that Uh, but dead anything alligators included is is a thing Um, so I will tell you about a story from it would have been 2013 Um, got a phone call from a gentleman who said that he lives on the water um, but he doesn't have a seawall he has an embankment and it appeared to him that there was a gator that was dead half in and half out of the water 
Uh, so the head to the midsection was out of the water. The rest of it, including the tail, was in the water. It seemed to be large. Um, pretty sure it was dead. Wasn't 100% sure, so he wanted to find out. He didn't want to poke it, huh? So he didn't want to get close. <laughs> nobody, nobody else wanted to do either. Don't poke so the gator, went, we yeah, say here in Florida. Stay away from the gator. <laughs> uh, so I went out to the house, um, and I pulled into his driveway, and it was a fairly large property. But as soon as I opened the door to get out, it smelled like a thousand rotting fish. So mm. at that point, I knew there was no possibility this was alive. This is clearly a dead animal, <laughs> and it had been decomposing probably for at least three or four days. Like a parrot so. on Monty Python <laughs> sketches. Yeah, you know. exactly. So so that was uh, going to the back and kind of seeing what was there. It was it was a good size. I'd probably put the guy at about three hundred pounds. <sighs> be about right. It was a it was a good size gator. Um, so the guy's first question was, "Is it alive?" I said, no, that smell that we're smelling, that definitely tells us it's not. <laughs> um, and then the 5,000 maggots pouring off of it <laughs> oh. also is a good indicator that it's definitely not alive. Uh, so he said, oh, okay, well, that's cool. Um, now what? Now what do we do? I said, well, it's pretty big. So the next part of this, you're probably not going to want to witness. And at this point, the neighbors were out because, you know, it was the guy was here that was going to deal with the gator. So let's go see what the guy's going to do. Sure. So the neighbors are all out, and everybody's talking, and cameras you know, like, rolling. Yeah, everybody got their phones out, and they're like, "Okay, well, you just are you gonna hook a chain or something up to it and pull it out of there? What are you gonna do?" I said, "No, that's what we're gonna do is we're gonna cut it into small pieces, bag it up, and then we're gonna remove it that way." And uh, that was pretty much the point where everybody decided they were going back in the house when the chainsaw came out. Oh, okay. so, there's there's no good there. There's no way to do this where it looks pretty. It's just one of those things that just doesn't look pretty. Let the listeners know that Jim so. and I are recoiling in horror. <laughs> oh, the visual of that. This is my recurring nightmare yes. of chainsaw gators. Exactly. So we had to make the big gator into small gator pieces. <laughs> and then we we're able gator to take bites. them out. And uh, so that's how we got removed out of there. So. So that, that was that one. I, I thought you were going to say you, you just took the pieces and threw them out so, for the fish to eat. <laughs> no, we tried to take it out. The, the decomposition was just, it was so bad. Yeah. Um, I wear a, a pretty good respirator um, that blocks just about everything out. Uh, it was to the point where I felt, like, and I don't have really much of a gag reflex for, again, with what I do and, and whatnot. But when I did have to take the mask off just from, from overheating a little bit, it was... You could definitely tell it was uh, it was a gag reflex waiting to happen on anybody. Well, it, I was it was rough. I was one of the people in the crowd with my cell phone rolling, and that might have been my cologne you smelled. Could have been. So, could yeah, have been. I don't I don't know for sure. So yeah, so so there's there's unfortunate gross things like that that happen, uh, but there's there's also no service for that. There's not a you know the first thing people think of when that happens is well you know I'll call the county or I'll call the city. Well, they they don't do anything like that. Uh, they'll pretty much tell you you're either on your own, figure it out, or let nature take its course and, you know, come let the, the predators come get it, um, or call somebody. And uh, since most people aren't going to wait for a full decomposition of something <laughs> that large, uh, they call somebody. And That'll they, kill your they, property values. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, nobody likes that. Uh, that, was, that was not a fun one. Wow. What else you got? Okay, so we'll, we'll only go with one more dead thing. I've got a million dead stories, but uh, we'll, we'll just do one more because this one's kind of funny. <laughs> um, it's funny, kind of. So I got another phone call from a gentleman. This was just a few years ago. And he said, I think there's a dead dog in my canal. Oh, dear. And it, with the way the current is, it keeps, I, he's like, I keep pushing it away with a stick hoping the current would take it. And he said, it keeps ending up right back in front of my dock. Mm -hmm. And he said, you know, the smell is really strong. And he's like, I'm not sure if it's one of my neighbors or what's going on with it. <laughs> and um, so I said, oh, well, let me come out and let me, let me take a look. And, you know, worst case scenario, we'll get it out of the water. Maybe we'll ID it. If there's a collar or something, on, we'll figure it out. So I get there. Um, and, you know, it was an older guy, and it looked like a dog to him. But as soon as I saw it, it was clearly a pig. <laughs> oh, oh, no. Not a dog. Oh, no. no. Uh, it was definitely a pig. It was a, It was just a wild pig. Um, was it dead? It was dead. It was on its back floating and, you know, stomach facing up. And, again, lots of maggots involved and lots of, <gasps> lots of smells. Ooh. And the guy wasn't kidding. As soon as I got there, um, he literally had this uh, paint pole. This, those paint poles that they can extend really far. Yeah. 
and I could see him on his dock pushing it out as far as that pole would take it and then I'm watching that and then you know hey you know it's Patrick hey I'm here and as he's walking over to me and he's talking to me for a few minutes and kid you not I keep looking over at it and it just keeps coming right back to the same spot at his dock (laughs) he just could not get this thing to go away Uh, he's like listen I've been trying this thing all day I keep trying to push it away it won't go away Um, he's like can you help me just figure out if it's a dog and if it's a neighbor's dog? I'm like, listen, it's definitely not a neighbor's dog. It's definitely just a wild pig. Um, and it, you know, something happened to it. It fell into the water, possibly drowned, possibly got into a fight. Something happened to it. You know, it, not a big deal. And uh, so he was glad that it wasn't a, someone's pet. And uh, he, we, between the both of us, it was tricky to get that thing out of the water because it was, it was a tough get. Uh, but we were able to get it out of the water, bag it up, and then kind of take that one out of there. You so. didn't have to take the chainsaw to that one. No chainsaws on that one. Wow. Well, that, that was just the right size yeah. to just, we triple bagged that thing up and took it out of there. <laughs> how, so, how big did you say it was? Well, that wasn't too bad. Um, that was pretty small, still juvenile. I'd probably put that one about 40 pounds, oh, okay. maybe 50 pounds. Okay. Reasonable, manageable. Nothing like the gator. So, I thought you were gonna, not the gator. I thought you were going to say it was a live manatee. <laughs> oh, I was, I was wondering if you're going for manatee. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Wow, interesting, <laughs> no, interesting. No, no. So that actually was a dead one. Yeah. That's uh, that's yeah. a good story. Now, what else? Uh, what okay, else has so, happened? Right, so we'll, we'll leave the dead ones. Uh, we'll leave the rest we'll of the stories for another peace. time. Yes, <laughs> exactly. Uh, so I got a phone call uh, once from a lady um, who's like outside my window at night in the middle of the night. I keep hearing this really strange noise, and I said, "Oh, okay." She's, I'm like, can you describe it? What's it sound like? Is it, you know, I'm thinking, first thing is, you know, frog. Is it some kind of frog type noise? She's like, no, I don't, I don't think it's a frog. It's just nothing I've ever heard before. She's like, I even recorded it. I'll send, the, I'll send you over a copy. I'm like, oh, okay, well, let me, I'll, I'll, I'll listen. So I listened to it and I didn't recognize it either. I was like, okay, this is, this is interesting. I have no idea what it is. So I go out there and I'm inspecting around the house. Nothing looked out of the ordinary, but she had, decent sized window sills on the outside so I could see that uh, something was there left a little evidence behind kind of looked like frog a little bit kind of looked like something I hadn't seen before but it was something so I said okay not something you're going to want to trap it's most likely because I don't know what it is we don't know what to put in for a bait to to attract it so I said let's put a glue trap in place so if it's something of this size which I think it is it'll stick to the glue trap we'll figure it out so I set the glue trap up, and then she called me the next morning, and she said, okay, I still don't know what it is, but it's on your glue trap. And I said, oh, okay, well, let me, let me come on out, and I'll check it out. So I get out there. I did not recognize what it was really? right off the bat. And I said, oh, okay, this is, this is something interesting. I'm going to have to look this up. I don't even know what it is. Wow. Um, it ended up being an exotic lizard. Okay, it was called a tegu lizard, an Argentinian, Argentinian tegu lizard, um, which we identified. Um, definitely not native. Um, Probably traveling without papers. <laughs> definitely not supposed to be here. Mm. So it was still alive. So I said, oh, okay, well, this might, you know, after I looked it up and saw that, you know, not harmful at all. I said, oh, okay, well, I may want to just keep this as a pet. This might be an interesting, <laughs> fun one to take back to my two young girls who, you know, might be interested in this. Mm-hmm. So we set a dry tank up for it and put it in there. It was a very colorful, it was a fun type lizard. It was pretty cool. And uh, we kept it. So the the point of that type of story is that we have things that nobody knows that are out there sometimes lots of invasive type things that don't make the news uh but in certain situations they make an appearance and we're like okay all right that's now been introduced to our area yeah. um and again this was several years back now looking up doing some show prep uh, prior to coming here looking up tegus um they're starting to turn into an issue uh, cool. in our area so yeah. it's something that is starting to take hold we're the perfect habitat for it and uh, it just takes a male and a female in yeah. a lot of cases. Yeah. And all of a sudden, you have a population. How about iguanas? Have you dealt with those? Uh, on, yeah, on occasion. Um, iguanas are very difficult to capture. Um, they're, they're one of the harder ones. Uh, they, they generally don't like to go into a trap. When you're, when you're trapping for something like that, it's usually going to be a large trap. Okay? You don't want a trap that's its size. You need something super size. Mm. Okay? Which and I, they can be very big. They can be very big. We've seen them. I think we measured one out once close to six feet. I mean, they can get to yeah. be super size. I've seen them. So you need the right size trap for it. Um, so they're very difficult to trap. They can, you know, they're herbivore. So they're going to be looking usually for a lot of fruits. They love bananas. Bananas are the big thing. 
But if they had a choice of going in your trap for bananas or bananas that are sitting on a tree, you lose that battle every time. So they're very cautious creatures. Not uncatchable, but they're very, very, very difficult. Mm. Um, they were the ones where the FWC, unfortunately, a couple years ago said, hey, if you guys see any iguanas, it's okay to go ahead and shoot them. Okay, which is you don't want to be telling the general public to be shooting anything ever in um, city limits, particularly. Yes, because you're when you say that, that means a lot of things to a lot of different people. Some people have a little more common sense and they assume you're talking about a pellet gun, okay, which is for the most part, you can get away with that. City limits, get away with that. To some people, shooting does not mean that. You know, that means mm -hmm. they're pulling out an AR, they're pulling out a handgun. <laughs> really? And they're shooting bullets. You've okay? heard of stories of like Oh, absolutely. This. Absolutely. Um, so when you feel like you're getting the okay from a government agency <laughs> to shoot, some people take you up on that. Now, again, shooting is, and you can, I mean, you can shoot these guys, um, but it's not recommended. There's far, far easier ways to deal with it, and you don't want to be missing your target. These are guys that can move lightning fast. I don't know if people have seen just how quickly they move. If you startle one, it can get away from your line of sight very quickly because they can move very quickly. You're always going to run away from people. Always going right? to scamper away, grease okay. lightning. They're not going to attack us. Not going to attack for the most part. <laughs> um, you know, they, they again, they're it, a monitor lizard is different. Okay, whereas they would. Okay, they would attack a person. They would attack kids. They would or attack dog. Uh, pets. Um, for the most part, iguana is going to run away from just about everybody. And amazing swimmers. You usually see them basking in the sun at a seawall on a dock. You start them. They're in the water, and it's shocking how well they swim. Mm. They, they swim more like a fish than they do anything else. Mm. So they're pretty amazing. <laughs> um, so with those, again, big recommendation there is don't shoot anything. Too easy to miss. Too easy to ricochet. Too easy to overshoot into your neighbor's area. <laughs> Lots of bad things happening. Um, best tip there is something called a uh, motion-activated water jet. Okay, so if they're coming on your property, can't be caught. A lot of times they can't be captured. It's very hard to the grease lightning type of uh, movement. So try to throw a net, not getting them. Um, but a motion detector water jet, what that'll do when you have a guy that is on your property, you can't get him off. This is kind of like a motion detector, motion detected light. It breaks the invisible beam, something, and it turns your light on. Well, this turns a water jet on that's attached mm. to your, your hose, mm -hmm. which is attached to a faucet, which is running at a pretty good clip. Um, and its goal is to blast out water very hard, very fast, 30 feet at 180 degree angle. So if your guy's breaching anywhere within 30 feet at 180 degrees, this is b -b 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 machine gun <laughs> fire right in the face with whatever the animal is. So if it's something you cannot get off your property, river otters, uh, raccoons where you have a pool cage, don't have a pool cage and they like to go in your pool all the time, you just can't seem to, you can trap them, but you can trap them forever and you can't stop it. Water jets come in super handy for repelling anything you can't or don't want to trap or don't want to pay for trapping. Um, comes in super handy. So always big recommendation. Huh, wow. Can you imagine uh, Jerry uh, Patrick's uh, little girls growing up? Tell us a story, Daddy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so he tuck him into bed. And, to, and, and if they were to say that to you back in the day, mm. what story might you have told them? No, not really. Tell, tell, me, <laughs> tell me a uh, wildlife well, story. Well, we would do better than that. So a lot of times... Um, like we, there'd be situations where juveniles got abandoned, like juvenile raccoons. Oh. So mom raccoon has some kits, group of kits. Uh, she doesn't come back. She gets, she's out getting resources. She gets killed. It happens. Run over, predator, things happen. Um, kits are left behind. So they got to see firsthand when I would bring those home first. We'd, you know, everybody get to look at them. I don't, not, not too much handling on that. And then they would generally go to Crow, the wildlife rehabilitator, the next day. We've done that with kittens that got left behind in certain spots. Um, juvenile armadillos, which are absolutely adorable, like little dinosaurs. Mm. Um, lots of juvenile things. So they've got they got up close and personal with lots of cool juvenile things growing up. Yeah. To the point where they're you know yeah they were used to that. By the way, do you ever need to uh, uh, trap feral dogs or cats? No, Never no. That's that? that's going to be uh, animal control, mm -hmm. animal services. Oh, okay. Again, our fearless government services yeah. that don't do a whole lot out there. Well. Um, that's the one thing they do, and I'm glad that they do it when they do it. 
Um, I know their funding for that stuff's not great, so sometimes it's, hey, we keep hearing this dog barking, barking, or dogs running through the neighborhood, and it could take them a while to get there. They do eventually get to it. It's a little slow sometimes, but they're the only yeah. ones authorized for stuff like that. Yeah, and by the way, you had mentioned FWC earlier. That's the Florida Wildlife Commission? Correct. Correct. Commission, okay, yeah. yeah. If you're listening from someplace else and are not familiar. Uh, we are going to take a very quick break here, but I am anxious to get back from it so I can hear more stories from our guest, Patrick Gibson. We'll be right back after this brief message. Hi, this is Sandra Aguilar, President of the Women's Council of Realtors, Cape Coral, Fort Myers, and you are listening to the Royal Palm Cast. Hi, this is Justin Tabo of LSI Companies, and you're listening to the Royal Palm Cast. Hi, I'm Molly Schwears, and you're listening to the Royal Palm Cast. You buy insurance for your car and for your home. Why not for your business? Hi, I'm Kevin Besser, your Director of Public Policy. Our PAC is the political arm of the Realtor Association, advocating for realtors and issues important for homeowners. In other words, insurance for your business. We need your help and support to protect your business and the rights of property owners. All it takes is $20 to insure your business and to protect the rights of homeowners. For more information or how to invest, please contact me at kevin at rpcra.org. Education, you need it, we've got it. I'm Angela Foster, Director of Education at Royal Palm Coast Realtor Association. If you're a realtor in Southwest Florida, the Royal Palm Coast Realtor Association has the classes, courses, workshops, and webinars you need to stay at the top of your game and keep your license current. Looking to build your continuing education hours? We offer core law and code of ethics classes to fulfill your CE requirement, along with many other courses to fulfill your requirements for specialty credits. Want to learn the ins and outs of the specific market you serve? Our A-Series provides an in-depth look at Cape Coral and Fort Myers with all the right experts to fill you in. Our Contract Series is a five-session course on listing agreements, far bar contracts, timelines, and more. It doesn't end there. Classes like how to stay out of real estate jail, negotiating skills, listing tips, conflict resolution, and many more keep realtors in Lee County up to speed with the latest information. Many of our classes are free to members and some are open to non-members. If you're a real estate professional who's interested in working in the Southwest Florida market, we've got you covered. For more information, visit our website at rpcra.org or email education at rpcra.org. Welcome back to the Royal Palmcast. I'm Jim Sandville along with Jerry Johnson. And our guest today is Patrick Gibson. He is a professional wildlife remover here in Southwest Florida, and Patrick has seen it all. So uh, today he's uh, giving us some of his favorite, most memorable stories of wildlife trapping, removing, whether they're dead or alive, he has done it. Uh, But before we get back into your next juicy story here, Patrick, uh, one thing I meant to ask you, do you need a license to do what you do? Do you have to be certified by any agency? Um, You do not. Um, This is one of the few areas where for the most part of what I do, you, you don't. Um, anytime you do anything with rats, for example, though, you do. Um, but outside of that, if you're oh, okay. trapping possums or raccoons, it's a it's a non-light for now. I mean, government, I'm sure there's always gonna be <laughs> regulations they make up at some point. Yeah. Uh, but for the moment, there's no regulations on that at all. Um, and we're hoping to keep it that way. Um, yeah. You know, less red tape on things, the better, and things get done more efficiently. So, yeah. so far, but, so good. But you certainly have the background for it oh, with yes. your expertise in exactly. biology. So. Correct. All right. So let's uh, jump back into a uh, another story here. Do you have any more left, or have we exhausted all of your wildlife stories? No, no. Got, we got plenty. There's okay, more? So there, all right. We, we got a few more here. Okay, so we'll make, do a couple of uh, quick ones. Um, got a phone call from a, um, a condo complex in uh, Port Charlotte excuse me, in uh, Punta Gorda. And um, they said that they lived on the third or the fourth story, one of those. Um, And there was an Eastern Diamondback rattlesnake in front of their door. And I said, oh, you know it's an Eastern Diamondback or does it just look like a big snake? I'm like, no, no, it's it's an Eastern Diamondback and I've got a photo, let me text it to you. So they text me the photo and lo and behold, Eastern Diamondback. Are they native here? They are. 
Uh, that's one of our four venomous snakes, of which we'll get into snakes in a bit. Um, so when you see something like that, something that has the ability to kill somebody or something, you want to make sure that's dealt with and it's, it's, it's dealt with immediately. Uh, so definitely confirmed Eastern Diamondback. So um, got the address, got out to the site, and it was a condo complex. And let's just say there was the crowd size, maybe 30 people. There was a, there was a crowd. Everybody's watching the, every move it's making. Um, and uh, so I got my stuff out. And as soon as I started bringing stuff out, the crowd starts cheering. I mean, I had, I had the whole audience going here. <laughs> um, so I had the uh, Eastern Diamond back. It, was, it had moved down some steps. And, just, and the crowd was far enough back. They, you know, nobody was in any type of danger. Uh, but I had a, a snake grabber, uh, which is a nice professional tool. It's kind of like a... Um, it's kind of like those extensions you see people use where they have a hard time getting things off a shelf mm-hmm. and it's got a handle on it with a little grasper end. It's kind of like that, but it's heavy duty for snakes. Um, so if you've got something big and strong, it can't just break out of it. You got the snake in that, you're good. Uh, so it's not a hook, it actually grabs the snake. So that's what I've got at that point. Um, Eastern Diamondbacks have very good reflexes and you want to make sure when you're making your grab, you're grabbing it. Um, as close to the head as you can. You don't want to grab the head itself. You want to be kind of just under the head. You don't want to be too far away from it. You don't want him to have the ability to strike once you've got him under control Mm. uh, because they can use their body like one big muscle. So you grab the snake near the tail, it can still strike your hand, your arm, without batting an eyelash. So you want to to know your position Um, and wear the right right materials. Um, I wear heavy-duty welder gloves when I'm doing things like that, and I... Tend to throw some long sleeve something on, so I have a little more protection. Uh, nobody wants to get envenomated. Um, so anyway, so I had the snake moving around and, and and striking at me as I'm positioning myself, and audience is ooing and eyeing, and <laughs> you can hear the the audible gasps. And uh, so got the snake, uh, big audience cheer. Uh, took the snake away from the crowd where nobody could see. That's not an animal you want to just go release. Uh, I guess some people might do that, but anything venomous, I'm not a fan of just doing a release on. Um, I do like to, to remove the head. Off with the head, so yeah. I was going to say. <laughs> Off with the head, um, just so it's a non-danger. Now, a non-venomous snake, I will never do that with. That will def- absolutely get released in a safe place away from people in, in, mm. in uh, homes. Uh, but venomous snake, that's just one of my rules. And we make sure that uh, it's dealt with at that point. Um, you can still be envenomated by a headless snake up to 24 hours, so you still need to be cautious. Envenomated? So that means poisoned? It means it means envenomated. It means your the fangs go into your skin, and it's getting shot directly into your bloodstream. When it's dead. Okay. When it's dead, up to 24 hours. So you got to be cautious. Even with a dead snake, you can still get envenomated, um, which leads me to a quick, quick little uh, uh, thing here. So... The common thing I hear people saying is, oh my gosh, is that a poisonous snake? Is it not poisonous? It's never a poisonous or non-poisonous snake. Poison is something you ingest orally. Okay? Ah, venomous. But it's venomous or non-venomous mm. because it, in, it is injecting directly into your bloodstream. Mm. Um, so you can have venomous creatures. You can have poisonous creatures. Like we have poisonous toads. If you eat them, can kill you your dog eats it it can kill you that's poisonous venomous is the correct term so just oh okay interesting okay little no i didn't didn't love to educate people i love that bit of knowledge (laughs) and everybody's gonna seem way more intelligent yeah um so anyway so there's that yeah um i'm just gonna move into some other yeah 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 What, what else you got so i will tell you that the first Six months that I started doing this, which would have been back, I would have say, late 2010, maybe somewhere in 2011. You were pretty new. Pretty new. Um, starting to figure things out pretty good. Didn't really have a firm grasp on everything yet. But I had gotten a phone call from a gentleman who I still know to this day. He's a great guy. And he said, listen, um, I'm not even going to describe what's happening right now, but can you get over to where I live? And I'm not going to say where that is, but it was, it was a, it's a, a name people would recognize in a condo complex, or excuse me, a uh, HOA in uh, mm. Fort Myers. Okay. I said, yeah, not, not a problem at all. He's like, I'm a home watch guy. Um, I, you know, I just do it as a favor to my neighbors who are out of town. And I said, we're having a, a major issue. So can you get here now? I'm like, yeah. 
So I get there and uh, he's like, okay, we're gonna walk in and uh, you tell me what you think's happening. And uh, he's in, the precursor was, I was here last week, I checked this once a week and it was fine, there was nothing. So tell me what's happening. I'm like, okay. He opens the door to the house and every bit of furniture in the house was destroyed. There was uh, cushions and foam from the couch, from the love seat, the bedding material in the bedrooms was destroyed. And it smelled like urine. And I could see feces. So my first thought is, somehow rats got into the living space here. Which again, not a common thing for rats for the most part. They like to do attics, don't really like the living space. This was different. Uh, the entire place was destroyed. I said, okay, well, they didn't start off with being in here because all the windows are closed and the doors are shut. And obviously he's been maintaining, make sure everything was fine. So I said, let's go into the attic. Let's see what's going on there. Clearly there's a starting point to this somewhere. We go into the attic and the attic insulation is destroyed. There's feces and urine everywhere. The AC ducts, okay, the big ducts that run the air through the attic, they look like big aluminum foil tubes, um, are shredded and that foil material is everywhere. There's no part of it that's not destroyed in some way. Uh, I wear a mask up in there just because of insulation, but I pulled the mask just to see what was, you know, smell it. I wanted to see what's going on and it was even more horrific mm. than inside. It was so concentrated. So what I was able to figure out, and then I inspected the outside, um, I figured out that rodents had gotten into the attic, but they had been doing the attic for a long time. It didn't just happen. Uh, the person apparently is a snowbird who's who's out of town six months at a time and hadn't been there in quite a while. Uh, but apparently when she was out of town for at least months at a time, something was going wild up in the attic and reproducing, aka rats. <laughs> so the rats were doing their thing and they had gotten to such a population up there because there was no portion of the attic where it wasn't ruined in some way. Um, that the house wasn't burned down, which was slightly shocking because there were wires chewed, didn't get chewed all the way through, thank God, in some spots, but there was no part of the attic that wasn't ruined with feces, with urine, with insulation, uh, with ductwork being destroyed. It was ridiculous. Wow. Um, So realized that that, that's what what had happened. And uh, so I thought, am I getting into the right business? I mean, this is the the craziest thing I'd ever seen. And I'm thinking, okay, is this how it's going to be? Because I'm not, I don't know. <laughs> uh, but anyway, the, the, the nice part of the story was um, her insurance did pay for everything, fortunately. Not everybody's does. If it's an animal like that, they have riders that, that don't cover these things. Uh, but hers did. And um, I actually remediated her attic. I pulled all the attic material out of there and we got, we, we uh, bagged it properly and, and disposed of it properly, Put disinfected everything, brought her whole new attic in. And attic was looking great. Uh, inside, everything had to be thrown away, carpets included, and repainted, and basically all new furniture, all new everything. Wow. Uh, but that was an early on thing where I started to second guess, is this what I'm signing up for? Well, how many rats? Yes, be like that's this? where I was going. Yeah, did how you many find rats were there? The live ones? We did. Um, <sighs> captures on that. So we had to set tra- We never set traps inside a living space, but on rare occasions. Um, we're in the dozens at that point. They dozens. just kept reproducing in that attic to where they chewed through the ductwork and they came through the vents, which I tell people there's almost no scenario that's even possible. This is one of the exceptions. It's really never happened since. Well, what are they eating so, uh, for months? Uh, they were still having access to in and outside the house. Ah. So it was just a shelter, yeah. but they just had gotten so, there had got to be so many of a population that they need to spread out. Ugh. So they spread out to some guys so stayed in the like attic. 50, some guys, 50 plus rats? Maybe not quite that much, Ugh. but several dozen. My Ooh. Lord. So it was not quite rat- <laughs> ratatouille level, but, but, but pretty like bad. crawling all over you. And so, yeah, enough to <laughs> where it was pretty them. gross. I won't be able um, to sleep tonight. The person was dead set on selling after she had everything done, and I convinced wow. her, no, I, once I have it all sealed from the outside, it'll never happen again. And yeah. It's never happened again. Yeah. yeah. So and Did, she didn't I've, sell. Literally, she never sold. Oh. She still owns it to this day. Huh. Um, and I've been over to her place several times. I, I, the person that called me, that home watch person, yeah. uh, he calls me on certain things. Huh. And I come check. Nothing's ever been like that. <laughs> Did you get photos of that kind but, of thing? Uh, 
you know, I didn't. Wow. And I should have. Again, been amazing. I was so horrified I, that I was just like, <laughs> I don't know, maybe I should go back to school and wow. finish, my, finish my doctorate. I don't think I'm going to sleep very well. Wow. So, I, I want to hear a different story. These are exceptionally <laughs> don't weird Don't tell cases. my wife that one. <laughs> okay. So <clears throat> we'll, we'll shift into a, a dangerous story. Ooh, okay. Uh-oh. So I got a phone call um, from... I get the phone call from on this. I guess this was also within a property manager. This is many, many years ago. And he said, I have got what I think is a, an extraordinarily, extraordinarily large hive of bees on top of a 10 story condo building. And he said, I've hired numerous companies, but as soon as they come out here, they're, they're not wanting to do it. I said, Really? Okay. Okay. I didn't, that's all the information. I <laughs> rarely ever get more information from people. So I got out there, and apparently what was happening was they were, the painters were there painting. This was one of several buildings, and they were painting, and they had very large crane equipment out there to get the guys up and down in the crane equipment, in the buckets, to be able to paint the outside of the building. And uh, so apparently the other companies who had been there uh, realized that once they got there, they were going up in the crane bucket. There were no steps getting you to this 10-story roof. Now, 10-story doesn't sound big. When you're on a 10-story roof, and it's a flat roof, and there's no safety anything. There's nothing to clip onto. That's just a f- literal flat roof you could step off of if you want to. That's enough to freak people out. But these guys were quitting the the got the job because they didn't want to get in the bucket and be raised up ten stories. It's a little disconcerting. And you know, I don't really have an issue with heights or anything like that. It was disconcerting for me, and I don't have any issue with these things getting in a bucket and going up and there's a swarm up there when you have to have a bee suit on which is big and bulky <laughs> and you have very limited peripheral vision um no way to to hook any safety equipment in is a little disconcerting a wrong st- again i can't emphasize peripheral vision you don't have it you can only see what's right in front of you you got to be careful but you're also dealing with something that could kill you in these bees mm. so when people see someone in a bee suit for the most part, they're beekeepers and they're working with their honeybees, totally different. Uh, when you're working with killer bees, they will swarm your suit and they'll sting you through your suit these without are, batting an eyelash. That's the species we're talking about, killer bees. We're talking about bees. killer bees, exactly. So these, which, uh, the best way to describe them is if you put them side by side with a honeybee, they look the same. But one, excuse me, the killer bee is wildly aggressive, whereas the honeybee is pretty docile for the most part. So the problem you have with the killer bees is when they find the weakness in your suit, which they will, because no suit is bulky everywhere. The the way a suit works is you're gonna get stung through the suit, but it's bulky enough it never reaches your skin, except in a couple spots, you don't have a choice. Wrists have to be snug, Mm -hmm. ankles have to be snug. When they find it and they get you, it releases a pheromone, that's now the target. Now they're all coming for that spot. Then you start feeling like you've been lit on fire. So you don't want to be lit on fire, panicking on a 10-story roof with no safety equipment, and you can go run yourself right off of that because now you're face down dead. Oh. So these Ooh. are these are just it's just a very dangerous type thing. So again, running through the whole calculus on how we was going to do this job, um, there had to be a bucket operator to get me up. I couldn't do it myself, which is fine. Um, he had no safety equipment or anything, so we ended up finding this uh, rolled up uh, bit of carpeting material. And I said, okay, that's gonna be your safety gear. So when we get up there and you got me at the top, I'm gonna make it as quick as I can, but you lay on the ground and you keep this over yourself. So you're fully covered the best you can. He's like, okay, whatever you say, I'll do whatever. I'm like, okay. So you do that, my job is to get in and out of there as quickly as possible. The longer you stay with things like that, the better chance you have of getting really hurt or worse. Mm. Um, you know, most people, if they're not allergic to something like that, you can become allergic to something like that quick. So you don't know what your body's gonna react to. So you don't wanna be stung, this is the whole goal. So the goal mm. is get in and get out. So got me up there, covered himself up, and I just literally had a mental timer in my mind. I've got 15 seconds, and I have to do this without falling off this roof. So <laughs> got onto the roof and had a big battery power blower, and I had a specialized dust in this blower for these guys. Found the center of the hive, blew it, and I knew they were coming for me. Like I said, <laughs> timer in my head's going off, but again, you can't panic. You gotta keep cool the entire time, or mm-hmm. you're not gonna make it. Um, I got to the bucket and I'm like, okay, get us down, get us down, get us down right now, right now, right now, right now. And he's like, yeah, no problem. So, you know, we went up at a slow pace and I never really thought about it that we were going to go down at a slow pace too. 
I'm thinking it's going to go down pretty quick, right? No, we're like, it, I mean, it was probably going down at a pretty good pace, but I'm like, I'm ready to be down. And this thing, it just feels like we're in slow motion going down. I'm like, we're going to die. Oh, my we're Lord. literally going to die. But no, he was able to get us far enough away from the, the everybody was concerned about uh, the queen and they kind of stuck around that, but they came all the way out to the edge. As we're going down, you know, a story or two, we can see them coming out over the edge. So had we still been hanging out, you know, an extra 10 or 15 seconds on the side, we'd have been covered. Yeah. Uh, but he got us down. Nobody got stung. It worked out wow. okay. But yeah, that, that was that was definitely, wow. definitely one of those. So How long after you did quick. that dusting and got down, did or, or the they all gone? Um, they usually, you won't see a full disappearance generally till the following day. Sometimes the next morning mm -hmm. is about right. Mm -hmm. uh, the the popular once they realize the queen's gone, they start to dissipate too. If they've got the dust on them directly, they're going to die too. Um, but things will start to break up, and you know by the next morning you're pretty mm -hmm. good. So I, without going back up the next day, just some binoculars on the ground was good. What I didn't realize was going on is we were attracting a massive crowd on the ground. You always oh, do. Wow. Oh, let's just see what was going on. Guy in a bee suit up on the building. What's going <laughs> to happen here? Well, everybody's got binoculars, <laughs> cell phones, and crazy stuff. Wow. Well, have you ever been uh, so, bitten or seriously injured? Um, yeah, a, f a few times. You know, a few who, times with killer you? bees. Uh, killer. I've never been scratched or bitten by any type of uh, you know mammal or lizard like wow. that. But I've ever nobody can do this type of thing and not get it with the bees. Yeah. You just it's gonna happen. Yeah. Um, gotten stung right between the eyes once with a wasp. I wasn't even doing a wasp. It was it had nothing to do with wasp. We were doing something totally different. <laughs> wasp came out of nowhere, got me right between the eyes. But I'm on a 27 foot ladder at the time. Okay. Oh. You got to have the same reaction. If you panic, you're dead. <laughs> You have to just take it. You just absorb it. Mm. Okay, I need to just get it. Because wasps can keep stinging you over and over. Oh, yeah. It's like electrocution. They're getting electrocuted. Oh, I never had one there. And, but I've had uh, one. I knew I had about you know, half an hour before my eyes swelled up. I mean, I had to oh, get off. I was done for the Lord. day at that point. Got off. I you know, yeah. got the stringer out and putting ice on my face. And it got down to my eyes and they just about swelled shut. So, I mean, wow. yeah, I you're, you're, you're going to get it occasionally. It on the top of my hand, the same thing. Just, ah, just blows right Water up. hand. Yeah, wow. it really blows up. They, every year, super though, they, painful. they put those nests up right at the corners of the garage where the garage door is. Wow, your business insurance must be expensive, <laughs> <Yeah>. huh? <laughs> Wow. It's up there. Yeah. Even my, my insurance, they, they don't even know how to, they don't classify me as what I do. I'm just still classified under a pest. You know, oh, okay. Like I'm an exterminator guy, yeah. which I'm not. Like no, Dale Gribble. Nothing to do with that. <laughs> um, but yeah, so well, speaking of that, if there are consistent areas where bees you see spring up or wasps, if you spray WD-40, Hmm. In that space, it leaves it slippery. If you're slippery, they can't land. They can't uh, land. They can't build any type wow. of nest. So it's a little that. little tip for any any spot where you're consistently seeing. You know, you spray yeah. WD four all over your house, but if you're seeing it on certain soffits or certain eaves, just spray a little WD. Works right. Ah, wow, awesome. interesting. Easy stuff. Interesting. Would you recommend this profession to others? Um, I would. I yeah. would. Um, you have to be. You have to be pretty fearless, in my opinion. This is not ringing my own bell. Um, if I were if I were hiring somebody, which I'm not, I I, I choose not to have employees. Um, uh, I would say that you have to go into it. Uh, you can have no fear of heights. Yeah. You can have no fear of being bitten by something. You can't have fears of going into attics. Um, you cannot. You're going to be in tight places. You have claustrophobia. You're not going to make it. Um, you have to be able to get yourself into situations and be able to think your way out. Uh, so I'd recommend it for, for the right person, the right mindset. Yeah. And that's, that's guy or gal. There, there's gals in my field who are probably better than I am. Um, so that, that part doesn't matter. Yeah. It's the right mindset. I think you got to have a certain physicality to you. Um, you're pulling yourself up. You're pushing yourself. You have to have some type of fitness level and stamina. Um, I mean, you're you gotta have stamina. You're in a hot attic sometimes in, in August, right? You're in a hot attic. Um, you got to again. You have to have a timer in your head for stuff like that. When you, especially in our area, you know, of the country, these attics get to be insanely hot. Mm -hmm. You know, you can throw a thermostat in an attic in 130 degrees. You have to have a timer of how long you can stay. You will pass out. There's nobody that won't. So there, there's there's factors for it. But yeah, I would say that, uh, yeah, it's for some people. It's not mm. for most. It's not for the faint of heart. Yeah. You're going to see some horrible things. You see some amazing things. You're going to be able to fix problems that other people just can't do. And there's a lot of satisfaction with that. What are the uh, biggest and smallest uh, animals you've ever trapped? Smallest. Um, 
biggest um you know we, we've gotten a few of the 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 bigger lizards we've gotten that um it's a good question though small ones um i've had people that just absolutely beg me not to set up snap traps for rodents and i will set up a live trap I've done that do people call you for um, mice i got a mouse in my house <laughs> They will say that initially, but it almost is never a mouse. It's, no. a, it's always a rat. Um, and again, we're back to Bergman's rule of when people see something small of a species that they've seen up north, like a rat, um, when they see a rat up north, they have a certain size in mind. When they see a rat down here, they're thinking, there's no way a rat's that small. It's got to be a mouse. It's a rat in almost every case. <laughs> so, so yeah, so, yeah. So there's that part. Yeah. Um, Got time for any more? Yeah, please tell okay. me. Tell me another story or two. Okay. All right. So we'll we'll do some quicker ones here. Um, all right. So woodpeckers. Woodpeckers are very interesting down here, and we'll get into more of the species later. Mm -hmm. uh, but two main species that we deal with, and they can do damage on homes where you've got decorative foam. Okay. And decorative foam is usually trim work or corbels that you'll see on certain styles of home where it looks like stone, but it's not. It's actually styrofoam. Uh, but it's textured, just like stucco would be, or concrete, um, and it looks strong, but it's not. Once the male woodpecker, who's always on the prowl for a female woodpecker to mate with, when they find uh, any material, they try to peck it first. The pecking noise of the male woodpecker is going to attract a female. That's why you're hearing the pecking all the time. That noise attracts. But what they're concurrently trying to do is open a hole at the same time that they can have a nest in, if it does successfully attract a female. Um, so they can peck a tree. Very hard to peck a hole in a tree, for the most part. <laughs> um, it could peck concrete, you know, or stucco on a house. It'll make a lot of noise. You're not going to open anything. But when they find uh, the, the styrofoam trim, it will give them the noise they want, and it'll give them an opening. Okay? Mm -hmm. So it'll, it'll turn into exactly what they're looking for. So you'll see on the homes where you'll you'll have you'll go out and there'll be holes all over the place because they've landed and, and they've pecked um so anyway we've got a great technique for for taking care of those guys we use a uh, you know a clear repelling gel that we like to put on things um and woodpeckers you know when i'm working when i'm doing something like that we repair the hole first and then we put our gel on afterwards so that they can't come repeck it otherwise it didn't, you know it didn't serve any purpose mm. and defeated the whole point so woodpeckers a lot of times will be in the trees as a staging point, kind of waiting for me to be done so they can get back to their work. Um, the house will be done and they'll go land back on it again. And as soon as they land in our repelling gel, that's it. Uh, they start to look around in a very panicked, uh, with a very panicked look, and then they fly off and that's the last we see of them. Hmm. It's just something they don't like. Uh, so we we have that a lot. They'll so just push them out. Way. You don't capture and release them. Don't just, capture and release. Yeah, that's another one where it's a move repel along. only. You got to find the best techniques for repelling. Yeah. Um, if you go off of the internet, uh, you'll see all kinds of techniques for woodpeckers. Dangle shiny streamers. Put an owl up with a bobbing head. Uh, hang CDs so that it reflects the light. Um, none of those things work long term. We've seen stuff like that work for maybe a day or two, mm -hmm. maybe. Usually doesn't even last that long. But they realize that it's a non-threat and they just get back to their work. The repelling gel is totally different. That's something that it's, it's a material they do not like to land in. Okay, It's something that can have an adverse effect on if that gets on them, on their wings. They can't fly and they know if they can't fly, they're dead. The ground predators will get them. So it works really good. So we have lots of fun with the woodpeckers that we, we like to video that after we do it when they try to land back on it again and they look around and then they fly off. <laughs> Last we ever see of those. Wow. Um, anyway, so I had a, f a very interesting phone call once with a lady who's like, um, my motion detector light keeps going off and I don't know what it is. I think it's a raccoon and she had been a previous client of mine with with something else and she said uh, would you mind setting a trap up i said yeah not a problem um i'm like how often is it setting off your light she's like i don't know like three or four times a night i'm like okay well let's do it was a late phone call anyway. i'm like well when it does it tonight take a photo send it over to me let me, let me just see what it is i'm thinking it could be anything she sends me over a photo and she's like and she was an older lady really sweet and she's like yeah definitely a raccoon well when i saw the photo it was a Florida panther. It was Ooh. not a raccoon. Oh my gosh! <laughs> I'm like, I'm, I'm looking at this, and um, I was eating dinner. With my wife, I'm like, April, 
what does this look like? I didn't even say anything. What does that look like to you? She's like, Florida Panther. I'm like, yep, <laughs> Florida <laughs> Panther. Wow. It's a Florida Panther in her backyard, and wow. it's just hanging out doing stuff every night. I'm like, so I call her back. I'm like, okay, not a raccoon. Can't set a trap up. Those are protected Florida mm. Panthers. She's like, really? It's a Florida Panther? I'm like, yes. Um, she's like, oh, okay, well, okay, I know why it's happening. Um, I've been feeding the dog in the back. I've been putting the food out, and I'm like, well, does he finish? She's like, should not always finish it so he can sit out overnight it was Uh, a track i'm like okay uh, you can feed the dog totally fine but whatever he doesn't eat just bring it back in for the night nothing gets left out at night for the nocturnal animals and uh, she did that and that was the last of it so uh, but very odd i mean you rarely get to see a florida panther let alone in someone's backyard (laughs) super 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 rare it was in which city uh, that would have been Fort Myers. Fort Myers. Fort Myers, too. Wow. Yeah, we, have, we have a lot of yeah, I know they're out by Gateway things. in that, that area sometimes. Yeah, but. a lot more things out that way for the most part. Got a lot more habitat area out there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, so that was an odd one. That was hmm. one that hasn't been reproduced since. Do you have one more story uh, before we um, wrap things up, uh, Patrick? I do. Okay, so this is a warning story here. Uh-oh. Okay, so... I get a phone call from a mini storage. I'm going to be very broad with this. Um, <laughs> somewhere in our area. Mm-hmm. Um, and they said that uh, we had a raccoon attack one of the one of the customers here that leaves his leaves something in storage. I don't want to say exactly. Well, I, can, I guess I have to say what it is. He <laughs> leaves his boat in storage. Right. And he would leave his boat covered. And he would come eh, once every couple of weeks. And he would just check on it, make sure everything's good. Um, goes out to check it that particular day, noticed that his cover was pulled back. And uh, so as the story went, and they actually had the security camera there to also go back over this, um, he noticed that there was a raccoon in there with juveniles. So he said, oh, well, I'm just going to take care of that myself. So he goes back to the office and doesn't tell him what's going on, just says, hey, you guys have a broom. So his idea was, oh, I'm just going to just shoot Shoot him out out. of there, just swat him out, you know, (laughs) no big deal. I'll just swat him out. And uh, so he gets the broom, again, doesn't say a thing, and uh, goes back to his boat, and, you know, he has to climb up onto his boat, and uh, now he's pulling back, you know, the rest of the cover, and he's going to, the way it looked to me on the video is he was taking a backswing, like he's going to smack this thing out of there. Well, their reactions are grease lightning, okay? So when he went for his backswing, it lunged directly for him, and he's not dressed for something like this he's got shorts and flip-flops oh, on so let's just say was, yeah. yeah he got it right where his foot meets his shin and uh, it wasn't pretty ooh, and uh ooh. so the unfortunate phone call i got was that raccoon's still here it was slightly off property in a tree with the juveniles now we got a major issue now we have a raccoon that's now attacked a person mm, now what do you do with that bad raccoon. right so he, now you have to do gotta go. something with that exactly so that was a really <laughs> terrible decision he made, and he paid the price for it. Um, I'm sure that was emergency surgery, and you don't know what you're dealing with, so you're automatically getting rabies shots. Yeah. Um, and let's just say the raccoon juveniles had to go to crow, and it was it was a whole big mess that was easily avoidable. So mm. the moral of that one is if you see wildlife, don't just try to deal with it yourself unless it's something very minor and extraordinarily safe call a professional on that or at least inform somebody of what's going on don't try to take something that that has the ability to hurt you like that you know something mm-hmm. that's got teeth and claws wow. and can do some damage Boy. don't take that into your own hands it's just it's not that simple you it's, have it's seen risk. it all it sounds I've like seen wow. a couple things wow couple things. all right patrick hey thanks so much again for stopping by the studio our guest has been patrick gibson he is a uh, professional wildlife remover here in southwest florida and he's seen it all and uh, we do enjoy hearing these stories hey jim yeah jerry i've got a request ask me anything can we ask patrick back for one more episode uh let me think okay yes yes all right patrick has graciously already agreed oh oh he's gonna in our next show that features patrick uh he's going to give us uh his list of florida's most unwanted critters and pests so we're gonna hear about that hey uh patrick uh i know you've got a website what's the uh what's the name of the website the address yes the uh the address is name of our company it's professional wildlife removal.com um got a little more information about all the different animals that we do uh some good tips on there for things things to look for yeah um easy to get a hold of us and uh yeah 
ProfessionalWildlifeRemoval.com. Very cool. Very cool. Hey, I want to thank everybody here at the association, especially our CEO, Beata Jones. I want to thank you, Jerry Johnson. Oh, me? Oh, thanks, Jim. Thank, thank you. you very much. And I want to thank you, most importantly, our listener for uh, finding us on your podcast app or other device. So thanks for being there, and we will look forward to seeing you again next time. But I want to make sure that if you want to get in touch with us, you know how to do that. That is via email. That's the best way. You can send us an email to shows at rpcra.org. That's shows at rpcra.org. Let us know what you'd like to hear about regarding home ownership, and we will uh, we'll try to get to it. So thanks again for listening, everyone. We'll look forward to seeing you again next time. Thanks for listening to the Royal Palmcast. Be sure to listen again each week. Share and subscribe on your favorite podcast app or YouTube. And be sure to check out our sister podcast, Realtor Riff Rap, and our video news show, Realtor's Corner, which can be found on the Royal Palm Coast Realtor Association Facebook page and YouTube channel. For information about sponsorship opportunities for this and other RPCRA productions, email us at shows at rpcra.org. This has been a production of the Royal Palm Coast Realtor Association.